and uh, oh, sorry. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, sorry, Vikram. <laughs> you know, the, uh, I, I, I'd like to thank uh, uh, Krish, Vikram, and other Mohit, other organizers for giving me the opportunity to, to come here, and particularly in a department which, uh, of course, not in this building. Uh, we work for such a long time, and uh, definitely is a happy birthday to TVR. And he was responsible for bringing me here, and exactly 30 years, two months back, he wrote me a letter. And the letter said that IIC is taking people who do like to apply. I applied in, you know, at the time there was no email, nothing, not even courier. It was only snail mail. And uh, the letter came three weeks after that. And December 28th, I got my appointment letter. IIC never saw me. I never saw IIC. I came together. And only two people I knew at the time in the department was Krish, who was a little senior to me at Cornell, and of course TVR, who was my teacher at IIT Kanpur, as that is the way he started. But at TVR, I uh, respect him for, uh, not that we have a lot of papers together, nothing like that, but the important thing is that he was a very good mentor. And the post-1990 department, he really built the department. And other than Krish, everyone joined due to him, I think, other than Krish. Professor H.B. Uh, but we, we are selected in the same selection committee. And uh, so, you know, and uh, we used to talk a lot, mostly physics, non-physics, everything. But uh, that's the way he really mentored me in various ways. And the topic that I'll discuss today, we'll try to blend two of the things Steve here worked on. One is the uh, area of metal institute transition disorder driven. I'm very happy that Professor Ravin Bhatt brought back that beautiful thing again in the arena of discussion today. And not over the a new material like graphene which Arindam talked on, but uh, rather uh, an old material, but try to see whether one can synthesize these ideas. And particularly the experiments that I'll talk about today have a direct link to one very recent paper published by the gang of four in 2007, not the old 19 uh, 79 gang of four. That is another gang of four. But this is the gang of four of Shenoy, Gupta, Krishnamurti, and TPR. And you will see that the experiment that I'm doing have a direct bearing on this particular paper. <laughs> Civil, uh, no, he's a gangster. He's a gangster. <laughs> anyway, and uh, uh, I, uh, this experiment was done in Calcutta, and this is the student who did it. I hopefully. The paper will see the light of the day sometime early next year. And uh, the experiment single crystals, I got it from my good old friend Mukowski, who gives crystals to everyone in the world and financial assistance. Now, the central thing that I'll be looking on is that if you have a system of electrons very close to the insulator metal transitions and their correlated motion, correlated dynamics, so you are talking here of energy landscapes which have multitude of low energy minima, and this can lead to glassy behavior. This has known for quite some time, mainly through a lot of new molecule simulations and all that, and it is extremely active area till now, and I find a lot of very good simulations were coming out. And it has been suggested by a group of people, including Swarovski himself, that this correlated motion, this slow relaxation can lead to low frequency one by F noise, and this is somewhat uh, closely kind of connected to the type of mechanism Arindamo was talking about, but not quite. It is not UCF type of noise, but it is something like a charge fluctuation. There is a very recent review which was issued by Professor Emery. A nice review. He kind of tried to put all the pieces together and try to see where the field stand. There is another central theme I would like to bring in that manganese actually pose a pretty new paradigm for insulator metal transition. They are very different from uh, the type of things that we look into, the either the doped semiconductor or even simple oxides. So it is not just disorder and interactions that comes in over here. You have the local spins, you have the orbital order and disorder, you have the gentler distortions, and they, all of them can play a very important role and can change the type of physics one is talking over here. In fact, you can say that if why I am trying to get interested into this particular problem once more was this particular aspect that maybe you are trying to look into a very different kind of insulator metal transition where some of the physics which is developed and developing are there, but 
it to that you add a lot of new ingredients and a lot of you know sauces to make it a little more interesting. Now there's a, one interesting piece of physics that we may need and it's an old important piece of physics is that you have a disordered insulator with highly localized electronic states then the Coulomb interaction affect the spatial distribution of the electrons and this is because you have to then hop over a distance scale of this particular kind and this lead to a single particle of density of state near the Fermi level opening up a little gap over there and that is what you call the Coulomb gap. So that will come over here for we are talking of a lot of electrons and you know like the manganites have a lot of electrons they are not uh, 10 to or 18 kind of electron but very few order more electrons they have and you are talking of uh, so many electrons moving into a disorder thing. So this is what F. Frost and Swarovski did in 1975. They did say that listen if you have the density of state and this is the unperturbed density of state then near the uh, chemical potential you do uh, have a gap and this is the, the famous uh, equation all of us use and that is where the transport across the gap, sub gap should lead to the F. Frost Solsky type hopping. So this is kind of the thing which is with us as a solid state physicist working in this particular area. There's one bit of thing I would like to remind you that when you say that actually you are not talking of a band insulator, you are really talking of an Anderson insulator and this is because you need a finite density of state here. And you know, like uh, you are digging a hole into the finite density of state. So, if you have a band insulator and you don't have a density of state, you are not going to get this particular type of effect. So, such insulators in principle should have a finite linear term in, in capacity, even if it is small. There is an older calculation, and now a lot of experiments are coming out that where the linear term in heat capacity is very small indeed. And they showed that this is actually done in the context of polarons and they showed that you do get a linear term in the heat capacity at low temperature in such a situation. Now let me come to the holy grail of insulator metal transition which Professor Robin Bhatt was referring to today morning and in my opinion this still remains on the clean but one of the uh, you know system where a lot of work can be done and uh, what I would like to tell that in the context of today's talk what is the region that we'll be uh, sitting on? We'll be sitting on in this kind of region, but not in phosphorus of silicon, but something in the manganites, and is very close to the critical regime. The electron relaxation come unusually slow, and one, one can observe <coughs> large conductance fluctuation. Let me tell you one thing that is when the I am talking of large conductance fluctuation over here, it is not universal conductance fluctuation. You see the universal conductance fluctuation in the disordered metal type, and that was we saw that in th that was Arindam Ghosh's thesis in 2001 that paper came out and we did see universal conductance fluctuation over here. But when you come over here, it is not universal conductance fluctuation, it is much larger fluctuation and it is essentially coming from carrier fluctuation. So what do we see when you do a 1 by F type of noise measurement near the critical region of the system? Unfortunately, there are not too many experiments. There is one reference I have missed out, missed out over here that was published on the same time. There is a, in the 2D MOSFET there was one paper which did find out that this noise starts blowing out and it becomes non-Gaussian and uh, there is very good signature of slow relaxation. And this was the experiment uh, Swastik Kaur did for his thesis, is now in his uh, faculty in Northeastern and Arindam the review will talk just before me. And uh, this one we did work on a three dimension system namely a first product of silicon system and we kind of the important point that we try to see is that whether the conductance noise in this regime arises from correlated electron motion and also the fluctuation becomes very importantly non-Gaussian. So let us see what we mean by non-Gaussian fluctuation for that will be needing it in some part of the talk as we go along. When you measure a fluctuation what you really do you pass a current and measure the voltage and really subtract out the average voltage and look into the little bit of pieces sitting here and there and then you know try to do a time series as, as are in them the, the, you know tune the voltage or the magnetic field and see what happens with fluctuation. So now if you suppose this is a real data in a copper film. 
So you have subtract out the average voltage and you are getting this voltage fluctuation. And uh, uh, this is uh, the typical voltage fluctuation that you see. And uh, uh, then if you take that voltage fluctuation and plot a, a you know, the just a probability uh, uh, distribution, you say that, okay, I have 20 nanovolt fluctuations, so many numbers, 40 nanovolt fluctuations, so many numbers, and all that. And you can see that as the temperature is increasing, the width of this fluctuation is going up. And if you, you know, don't plot it in a linear scale, but if you plot it in a uh, log scale over here and the delta V square over here, you can immediately see that this fluctuation follows a Gaussian and this width is really giving you the you know the, the RMS fluctuation and you remember the Vaskaran was the external examiner in Arindam's thesis exam and Arindam did show this data Vaskaran asked a question that can you uh, detect individual defects this question is still live in my mind Vaskaran that's why I'm bringing it up after 10 years okay <laughs> You know, you public, uh, sorry, this cannot be published for this is, uh, you know, very well known thing that everyone working in the field does, you know, okay. So I am not complaining, Vaskar, how can I, you know, like, yeah. now, uh, see, important point is that the non-Gaussian fluctuation, you know, is not only it gets enhanced as we approach the insulator metal transition, it also uh, depends on the temperature. So let us see what happens here. So these are the, as I am, in, you know, uh, decreasing the, the NC, that is, uh, as I have the, the density of electron and coming closer to the critical uh, region, and you can see the uh, uh, fluctuation, which was Gaussian for more metallic samples, have started getting these long tails over here. And uh, and uh, you know this is a very clear signature that you are getting non-Gaussian fluctuation. And if you are taking the same sample and at 4.2 K it shows this tail, you to higher temperature, the tail again vanishes. For it therefore depends on the time and uh, and uh, the, sc uh, the scale of relaxation and all those things. Okay. Now there is the end of what I like to say about the fluctuations close to the insulator transition in such system like phosphorus dope silicon. Now can we bring these concepts into the field of manganese and start looking into the problem and particularly ask this question that if we have ferromagnetic insulating states in materials like manganese, is there a possibility of an electron class and that is the uh, theme of today's talk. Now I know that you have a fantastic chairman and he will not stop me but I do have to have a catch a flight so that's why I'm looking at my own watch for I have to leave as soon as I finish. So uh, Vikram, I'll be doing my self timing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Vikram is a nice guy, you know, he's a beautiful guy. You know, okay. <laughs> so now when you come to <laughs> you know, this this family of the <laughs> Vikram. <laughs> of course, I will. Any time. Okay. Now if you have an antiferromagnetic uh, you know uh, uh, manganite and you hold dope it, you know this uh, whole field of colossal and magnet resistance comes from that. And this is just to for this my younger friends who may not be into this kind of field, that this is the type of complex material one is talking about and it is this particular uh, uh, you know bivalent substitution that you do and you create hole doping. So it is essentially a hole doped antiferromagnet that one is talking over here. Now if I look into this hole doping and this cons you know the variation in the resistivity and all these things in the manganese system, question is that can I bring into the language of insulator metal transition. So let us just look into some data. These are three single crystals. This is the one very metallic system where you see colossal magnet resistance. This is the one which is the insulating one, and this is the one which is lying at the critical region of the insulator metal transition. And you can see that a mere 20% change in the carrier concentration can lead to our 7 8 order change in the resistance. So, the important point is that if I take samples close to the critical region, maybe point to even 0.18 is not too far away, then what happens to the conductivity fluctuation? So that is the type of question one is asking. So uh, in what I mean by ferromagnetic insulating state is that if you look into it, that is the 
in this material the resistance is rising there is a ferromagnetic transition over here this kind of mixed phase over here the resistance comes slightly come down or even flat and then it goes into an insulating state and that is the ferromagnetic insulating state one is talking about and in that state if you take the resistance and you find that it follows the famous Efrostolsky kind of uh, hopping region so this is the region one is talking about so we say that listen we may be having a variable range hopping in the Coulomb gap and then you know is the signature of uh, the type of system one is talking about. Now let me just uh, take this problem and put it into some kind of a very simple uh, phase diagram with nothing much very complicated. He said I started with the anti ferromagnetic insulator and at this critical comp composition I ended up with a ferromagnetic metal and in between at some composition the ferromagnetic state becomes stable but it is still an insulating state. So it is this particular composition range one is talking about and this is the Coulomb interaction in dissolved order can a very play a very important role. Now again if I borrow the language of the phosphorus dope silicon kind of thing, the experiments that we will be doing over here will be around 0.9 of the critical concentration or 0.85 of the critical comp composition and try to see what happens. But right you have been much easier if these two uh, points would have kind of collapsed. That is the point where it is become metallic, this is exactly where it is become ferromagnetic. But unfortunately it does not happen, that is why all of us are employed. Now additional factors which come to the critical region. As I am telling you that it is not only just pins and carrier when you talk of about the insulator metal transition into this class of problem. There is something which happens to the orbitals and the gentle distortion. This is an old neutron data and it is a very interesting data. It shows that very near the critical composition how does the orbital ordering temperature change and how does the uh, distortion which is the gentle distortion vary. You can see that that this is the region where the metallic state comes in and this metallic state comes in only when not only that you have the critical composition but the orbital order has to uh, you know this temperature has to go to zero and this gentle distortion has to vary. So it is not only just the spin and the spin order, it is not only just the carrier density there are important factors which are coming from the orbital order or disorder or and from the gentle distortion. So that is exactly what makes this field the insulator metal transition as I say is a new paradigm into this class of material but there are other factors coming in which are not present in most of the other simpler oxides like you know NaXWO3 or phosphorus of silicon where of course the value problem is there you know which are important. Now this is not only the one material that you see this kind of a Frostovsky kind of system. There are a lot of other systems. This is a homegrown crystal made by Professor Bart's group and uh, here also you see that uh, uh, this kind of hopping relation is valid. There is one very interesting piece of information that this insulating state is actually stabilized by cationic disorder. Like if you take uh, this material this is the critical composition when the metallic state shows up. If you take this material where the disorder is much more the cationic radius are very different then this is where the uh, 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 this is where you see the uh, metallic state coming in. So cationic disorder is an extremely important ingredient in this kind of material. Now let me come to the important point that this is an insulating state and I would be expecting it to have a uh, uh, finite, uh, uh, I should be expecting that the linear term in heat capacity should vanish but if you do the heat capacity you find it is does not vanish. There is a little st uh, small term over there and this is the term which is telling you that you are dealing with a kind of insulator which is not a truly band insulator. And this extra linear term that you are getting over here is not uh, coming from uh, any magnetic thing for if we apply something like a 14 Tesla, the black and the red curves are falling on each other, one letter is at 0 Tesla, the black curve and the red curve is at 14 Tesla and these two specific it fall on each other so it is no magnetic component present over there. So now if I take that little bit of a heat capacity uh, linear term present over here and try to calculate numbers from it, what do I get? 
Now, what is the number of, it means that I have a lot of localized states in the Fermi level. Now, if I calculate from this the density of state at the Fermi level, which this gamma gives me, I can use this just a simple free electron approximation. I can find out the value of the Coulomb gap from this simple relation. And then we do that, I get a very interesting number, which is in the ballpark about 100 MeV. And this is, of course, much larger than the KBT that we were dealing with. Here, these oxides differ from the semiconductors. If you calculate these things for semiconductor, this terms, of course, is very low. And typically, one is talking of this Coulomb gap between 1 to 10 MeV. But for most oxides, where this kind of experiments are present, if you calculate, these numbers vary between, I should say, 75 to 100 or 120. So the Coulomb gap is essentially large, and that essentially comes from this large density of state at the Fermi level, but there are a lot of carrier concentrations and they are localized. So what are the consequence of such a large Coulomb gap that you are seeing? So what will happen is that you can have the region of the configuration space, they can become you know, inaccessible uh, at the ground to, uh, in, in the at low temperature, particularly if you go to a temperature which is much less than the delta by KB, where delta is the Coulomb gap, and this can lead to something Sure, 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 no problem. Sure. Of course. So, in geometry, there's a soft gap. So, at the end of the day, there's no density of states. See, soft gap is zero. Yeah. So, but you know, if you integrate. So, so this is what, what have been the underlying density of states in which you have That's correct. That is, that is where I've dug into. Yeah. That is the NEF where you have dug into. Exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that is what is coming over here. You know, actually, this is a very important point for, you know, this sensual scale up delta CG. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I, you get the, you know, you get the identical data. From, you know, you get it from the transport also. You have to take 20, 30 percent, we get the same data. Like the one where you got 150 transport, you got 105 or 120 of that order. Also you know. Yeah, we did it uh, DC, 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 you know. And this gap, keep this number in mind for you see that coming up in a very interesting way in the noise. Okay. And as you guide it to this again, this review by Emery, where he did talk about the Coulomb gas formation on this thing, this kind of thing. Now, as for the glassy state in manganese go, there are a couple of previous experiments where there are kind of uh, uh, the evidence of slow relaxation. One is this by this Greek group, and they did see that uh, both from the manganese and lanthanum NMR, that as you go to lower temperature, there's a tremendous slowing down of the relaxation time of the spins. And they said at the time, in fact, they used the word that this kind of spin glass state forming or orbital glass state forming. And uh, um, one of my student over here, when he did this transport experiments, he did find one very interesting effect, which at that time I was not very really clear about what it is. The way it goes is that you apply a current, then it takes a long time, the scale up 20, 30, 40 seconds before the voltage develops when it comes to this thing. So there is some long relaxation coming over there, and this is where we started looking into the problem. So what about the noise in the ferromagnetic state of the manganite? Let, let me come back to this equation which Arindam has also shown and which all of us born in the solid state physics community with this equation. This is our Bible, and uh, here, uh, just to tell you that you can get a, f f a conductance fluctuation either from this or from that. When you talk of universal conductance fluctuation, you are actually talking of the fluctuation in the mobility and the type of fluctuation that we will be talking about, which are somewhat in the insulating state, the more in the fluctuation in the carrier density or DND, whatever way you look into the problem. So. It is not the usual 1 by F noise. The reason is that if you have a material which is not so good, if you made a film or something, you get an enormous amount of 1 by noise into F noise into it. And those 1 by F noise most of the time come from new as it happens in many of the magnetic fluctuation for the charge carrier density is fixed over there. So what are the questions we asked? And I will go a little, you know, 
quickly over here, that is, do we see a large fluctuation? That is what we started with, that as we approach the transition, do we see a large fluctuation? Is the fluctuation non-Gaussian? There will be signature that the electron dynamics is indeed correlated. And then I'll be asking the question that if there's a glass light freezing, do I see a freezing of the fluctuation? And if so, what is the time scale or the energy scale associated with it? These experiments we do are done both in single crystal and now in films. But I'll show you only the single crystal data. Let me tell you why. What's the problem in films? The reason is that in this region, the whole sample is very sensitive to the strain and the strain in homogeneity in films. So you start seeing a lot more effects in the films compared to the single crystal. And we don't understand that yet. Maybe next year we'll be having a complete story on that. So the data I'll be showing you is only the data taken on the single crystals. Okay, and this is the uh, noise that you measure, the 1 by EF noise and all that. And you can see this is the alpha over here. The alpha has a slight temperature dependence, and that is is typically within the ballpark of 1 plus minus 0 0.2. And you can see that at uh, the some temperature like 50K, the noise has started coming down. And is this noise uh, large or small? So what you can do is that this you can take a crystal which is 0.3T, which is a ferromagnetic metallic state, and this one TC, this is uh, something like uh, 185 Kelvin or something like that. So most of the data is, you know, the TC is contained over here. I'll show the temperature dependence. It's a good question, uh, Krish. Okay, now, uh, uh, you know, Krish is, I said, very difficult. I call you by nickname, but in the audience, I didn't want to use it. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, you know, uh, so, uh, but what you find is that in the metallic state, the noise is about uh, four orders less. So, in that case, the noise, if you say four order less, you can say that these are not coming from structural defects, which is very important. Now, let me tell you that it is not that all the manganites in the world are born with one by EF noise. There are manganites which are have other features. Let me come to a uh, data again taken in this department a few years back, and this was taken by Obik Bid for his master's thesis, and this is a charge order manganite. So if you take the data near the charge ordering transition, you find a very different story. You find that this is the one this is the noise, this is the frequency, this is the temperature. And you find that it is one by F away from the transition, but near the transition it gets you know uh, what you call the random telegraphic noise and all that. So question is that this is another signature that you can see in manganite, but for this system that you are studying, the noise stays strictly 1 by F. Now let me do the temperature dependence, and that you find is also rather non-trivial. This is the resistivity, and you find out that there is a, you know, there is some variation of the noise over here. It is in the log scale, so, you know, it is kind of suppressed. We have some explanation about this part, why it is so, and all that, why it is a drop at TC, why it is again goes up. But the interesting part is this part that below certain temperature this noise starts coming down very rapidly and we like to know that why it is coming down so rapidly. So that is the focus of today's talk. So this is the part, the rapid fall at low temperature, that is what we will try to understand. So our question is that do you see a kinetic freezing, that the fluctuations are having much more longer scale than our scale of measurement. So how do we do that? So we do that in a uh, different frequency we measure this quantity, you know, like it's a function of temperature. So you evaluate this quantity, the spectral noise, measured at different frequency by about two orders of magnitude. It's a very limited temperature and frequency range that you get, but you do see an activation over there. But the important point is this activation energy. Look at this scale. It is tantalizingly similar to this Coulomb gap scale. And this is exactly, uh, I think, the important discovery that we had from this experiment, that there is indeed a kinetic freezing of the fluctuation, and the scale of the freezing is dominated by the Coulomb gap. When you first did the experiment, we thought that you know, it is just a, an accident. Then you vary the composition, and uh, that changed the delta Cg, that changed the Ea. We did find that these numbers just are close to each other. And if you remember, they're very different experiment. This came from heat capacity. 
and this came from your noise freezing. So you know, like uh, their closeness uh, is, you know, I think is very gratifying to see that. So the important conclusion that you could uh, draw is that that there is indeed an activation barrier to the fluctuation, and it is coming from the Coulomb gap. So now. How do we then find the non-Gaussianity? It is coming, you can look in the probability distribution function. You can also look into a horrendous system called second spectrum. Now, uh, so let us see what do we see there. And here we have plotted in the way Gaussian fluctuation should be seen. You can see at high temperature it is Gaussian. But if you go to lower temperature, this tail comes up. And this tail is very distinct tail in the sense like uh, those who are in this business, they know that you can change this quantity by what you call the bean size. That is how large a delta V that you should be used for counting. There is something like a well, list count. So you have to, when you get this result, you have to make sure that it is independent of the bean size. So this is a, a long tail that comes in the distribution. And the second spectrum is nothing but you actually calculate the square of the power spectrum and you normalize it by the uh, you know, power spectrum uh, and square. And what you find there is that if it's a totally Gaussian noise, then the second spectrum is determined by the first spectrum. So uh, if it's a normalized second spectrum, it should be 1. And if it's a non-Gaussian noise, then it is not 1 and you can get a time and a frequency dependence coming into it. And uh, you know there are not too many people measure it. You know, like uh, for the measurement is difficult. Understanding is even more difficult. And this is one thing which confuses the referees. Like your paper may be stuck for two months for the referee doesn't know what is second spectrum. So you have to explain him in repeated papers in a write up that it is second spectrum. Okay. Now what do you see over here? So if the noise is Gaussian and if you calculate the second spectrum, I should be expecting this thing over here. But you do find that as we uh, you know, kind of start cooling down, there is an enormous contribution which is coming from the non-Gaussianity factor coming in. You find that even near the higher temperature, you have some contribution uh, uh, coming uh, from the non-Gaussianity. Some of them can be little artifact for you have a finite uh, uh, bandwidth in which you are working. So let me, how do I try to explain the data? So let me now come to the kaleidoscope of IISC and which the gangsters have produced. And what the gangsters have produced is a beautiful diagram like this. And this is the face separated carriers in a ferromagnetic insulating state of manganites. So what they have said and which I find rather interesting is that in their model, as you know the TVR and Co model, that they are talking of two kinds of carrier. One is the band type of carrier and one is the localized carrier. When the charge carrier density is low, then there are puddles of band type of carriers and this is the uh, B phase and there are percolating uh, you know, uh, localized carriers. If you go to higher carrier density, then these puddles kind of join up and you get the metallic state coming in. So if I use this picture, then it starts rather uh, interesting to see how the noise can come into that. And you know the important point is that the hopping conduction that occurs, it occurs into this metallicity phase. So now if you look into the hopping conduction itself, even in the majority phase, there are clusters which are finite size, there are clusters which are not so larger size, so there is a variation they cluster into that. So what we propose to understand is that, that while the hopping conduction occurs in the uh, localized phase in the fermenting insulating state, we can have you know, carriers excited to the B phase by thermal activation and there will be exchange of carriers between the two phases. And so they, you know, like in a statico, they may look identical, but we can have exchange of carriers between them. So if you have exchange of carriers between them, then we are going to get uh, large charge fluctuations coming in. So now we can kind of uh, not so trivialize, but kind to look into it. You say that, you know, when I have the normalized power spectrum, essentially I'm talking of the ratio of the fluctuation of the, the size and the size itself. Now, 
this is the size of the cluster that is involved in hopping conduction and this is the fluctuation the size of the cluster due to the exchange of the carriers in the B puddle. But the important point is that both these are temperature dependent. So ultimately the temperature dependence that you are going to see will be determined by the temperature dependence of these two parameters. There is a work done by U and uh, Co. They have actually worked in the percolating systems and they found out that the size of the cluster has a, a temperature dependence going as t to the power n. What it means is that you get as you go to higher temperature you get bigger clusters and as you go to lower temperature cluster goes down. If that happens then I should be seeing the noise going up at low temperature and in many of the percolate in many of the systems in which you have hopping conduction noise do go up at low temperature. But what is also important is that if the, this tub does not have any temperature dependence then, then noise should go up at low temperature. But what happens to this term? Now this term will vary because you are getting a carrier exchange to the L regions and also the, you know there is a that is the see it's a polony glass kind of phase they are talking about. So there are small clusters and there are infinite cluster and there are exchange between these two clusters. If that happens then this is what is going to be your main source of fluctuation. Now what we find is that it can happen that when you are below the ferment insulating transition and as this B puddle and the L matrix they are kind of separated out the uh, band type of electron and the localized electron exchange start freezing out as you go to below the ferromagnetic insulating transition temperature and also in this case the probability of polaronic hopping becomes exponentially small at lower temperature. So both of them will reduce delta NL very drastically as you go to lower temperature and this is what you are seeing as the freezing. So this is indeed what what I say is that there is some kind of a physical basis that in the ferromagnetic state large is nanoscopic phase separation there is indeed a large noise and the fluctuation kind of starts critically freezing out at lower temperature. Well now I go into something which is rather uh, not understood by me as talking to Vikram um, uh, during because you are awake right and I am on time. Okay, fine. So, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, like I was talking to Vikram during the tea time that in this kind of systems which you call electron glass, what happens to the fluctuation distribution theorem? And two things can happen that the electrons b can decouple from the phonon bath. From the uh, resistivity relaxation, we have a clear evidence for that. But ca it can also happen that the at some limit the even electron themselves cannot equilibrate among themselves and you get to a totally non-ergotic region. So there is one physical quantity which is very much related to this all these things and that is the Nyquist noise. And all of us you know at some time or other even at the level of life has read about Nyquist noise and what it tells is that if you have a sample it does not matter whether it is made up of wood or gold or any valuable material that you can think of on earth you know like uh, if all is given if the temperature is given Nyquist noise is defined. It is such a beautiful relation and it is a white noise since it is spectral power so it does not have a frequency dependence till you go to very high frequency and this has been used by engineers very often to find out the device temperature. But what is very important is that the Nyquist noise is actually manifestation manifestation of the fluctuation dissipation theorem. So if anywhere you have the breakdown of the fluctuation dissipation theorem the Nyquist theorem can go ahead by. So my question is that are we seeing something like that and this is wherever region of unknown. So two things we can investigate using the Nyquist noise. I can use it as a thermometer and measure the electronic temperature and compare that to the phonon temperature and find out are they differing or I can you know find out where the electron temperature is a defined concept or not. So the main caveat over here is that this Nyquist theorem is based on the FDT and uh, you know like if the system becomes non-ergotic the system uh, you know loses thermal equilibrium and is not going to give it to uh, fork give it here. You know nowadays these terms like FDT scares me for you know it's like FDI and all these things you open newspapers you find such terms so I avoid uh, 
you know acronyms okay now uh, what do we do experimentally and what do we see what we do is that we have a little unique setup huh? For temperature is what you measure this is the bath so you are connected to a copper block so see any temperature when you measure by putting it to a copper block this is a phonon temperature it may be i'm not saying it is not but it may be okay so that is what we wanted to find out so experimentally what do you see see this is the one by f noise part that i talked before and this quantity is enormously dependent on the measuring power and has to go as v square if it is the power goes as v square you know that you are measuring the proper one by f noise and this is why the 4 kbtr is sitting over here and uh, this is the measure 4 kbtr in the sample that you are talking about now this is a very important number just to check that your measurement is correct or not you should always measure this noise if your measurement is wrong in the sense like you have lot of uh, you know extraneous noise contact noise and everything this won't sit at 4 kbtr it will float somewhere over here so this we actually use it sometime as a good diagnostics now so this is the measure the white noise as a uh, function of the input power so why as a function of input power for we know that if i change the input power this noise should change and the nyquist noise doesn't change so as long as TE the electron temperature does not change so that is the thing that we uh, try to look into so let me just uh, tell what it means suppose I go to the market city market or some place and just buy an ordinary resistor costing not more than rupees 5 so don't go for a costly resistor you know cheaper resistors are better so what I do is that I just pump a lot of power into it and look into the white noise you find they're the same so if I now plot it as a function of frequency what do I get this is the white background noise I just scale it by this quantity I get something like one give or take a five percent and you can see that if I change the measuring power by about ten to about four times this doesn't change this is a very important test that your measurement is correct and the resistor you have purchased is a good resistor when you come to manganites when you change the input power and the way you do the experiment is that we apply a DC and measure the noise in AC. This actually has been uh, you know, developed over here, this technique, and we are using that. And you can see that as we are increasing the measuring power, the uh, white noise has started uh, changing. And what we get there, so we again define the quantity that we measure the background noise and divide it by the Nyquist number. And we start seeing horrendously large numbers coming up if you go to a very high power. Now just to pack the talk here, I just show you one little view graph. If I measure this quantity, which is the ratio of the background noise divided by core KBTR, which you know a good man like Nyquist had given us, and we measure it as a function of power, then obviously if it is one when the power is low. So you know like you have no problem in the world, everything is in equilibrium, you know, everything, you know, there's no conflict in the world. So this is what we mean. So but you know what happens is that till a power about a microwatt we see that the electron temperature becomes about a couple of times more than the phonon temperature. And if we measure the resistance and use the resistance as a thermometer itself of the sample, we can found a, find out the electron temperature. If we do that, we find out that after this temperature that, uh, uh, that is beyond this power, we enter into a regime where the electron temperature has decoupled from the phonon temperature. But if I go to very high power, then of course there are a lot of heating effects happen and all that. But what about this region where, you know, disaster does not happen and we are still in, uh, you know, some kind of a uh, defined region. And that is the region I'm talking about. And this is the region where we feel that the electron has lost internal equilibrium and, you know, there is nothing called uh, electron temperature anymore. Now we have uh, looked into the relaxation of the voltage in that region and we find that it becomes a very long tail like sometimes lasting for hundreds of seconds like if you change the current so you know like uh, uh, things have really uh, become much more slower much more sluggish and is no longer equilibrium as you would like to think so let me just conclude my talk and uh, what I gave you that 
if I take the ferromagnetic insulating state close to the critical region, there appears to be distinct type of insulator. And uh, in this region, we see large charge fluctuation that can kinetically freeze out. And the time scale for the freezing out is essentially determined by the Coulomb gap. And we also find there's a likely signatures of an electronic glass, which has a large non-Gaussian noise and likely deviation from the fluctuation dissipation theorem. In the last one is something we are now currently working on. And uh, the, the, you know we are getting now reproducible data, but the analysis is where we have stuck. So I'd like to thank you. So you are studying uh, close to metal insulated transition yes. where it's a first order transition. So this should be generic to many other metal insulated transition systems. Is it first order? Um, normally metal insulated transitions because but of the But if it's a composition driven, there's a critical point. So you say that this and is not I a stupid order. guy was the pundits, they will tell you. So you are saying that yeah, it's a transition across XC. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Why some sort of the scale point one electron volt have sense for you as a Coulomb gap? Pardon me? Why something of a scale point one electron volt has sense for you as a Coulomb gap? Uh, let me tell you. One thing that you can do is that you can directly measure the density of state by tunneling. And you see that kind of gap coming in. Oh, okay, okay. No, no. To we have a gap. See, what I'm telling is that I just use the numbers and I find that what I measure from the tunneling density of state is there is the number I am finding out. There is a gap in the density of state. It can come from some other reason, but I don't know whether it will change the dynamics. Yeah, it's a large one. It's a so long. You have to go to a, you have to go to a very long distance. Yeah. So what do what do you think is a reasonable Coulomb gap? No, that is in phosphorus drop silicon or boron drop silicon, arsenic drop silicon. I'm willing to believe that for the density was very less. But you know, I'm not vouching for Coulomb gap. What I'm telling is that is there a canonical scale of Coulomb gap? <coughs> You got a very large Coulomb gap. A lot of uh, temperature. Two or three atoms. Two or three atoms, yeah. So I have a fundamental doubt, like. Uh, if I understood it correctly, you have used that uh, uh, classical noise expression uh, 
that 4 kbt e to get uh, the temperature t is that correct yeah what i'm telling is that if i use it as a measure and then i use uh, i have the measured white background noise scale that by 4 kbt r if it is equal to 1 then uh, you know I am in the equilibrium. So uh, my doubt is in the fact that that derivation itself uh, uh, doesn't it constitute of the fact yeah, yeah, that, that I'm telling that it's in equilibrium. So sure, yeah. sure, that is what I said that you know if there is an important caveat that one can use that expression if we have thermal equilibrium. If not, then obviously you see a large deviation from that expression. I said that you know that is the main thing. Yeah. Thank you. So you know, when the question is long, you have to drop me at the airport. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, the question is uh, the non-Gaussian. See, you are actually taking the non-Gaussian as a as a, uh, as a sort of manifestation of correct, uh, correct, uh, yeah. Hmm. The problem is, you know, particularly when you have a two-phase kind of system, you can get it. Another oh. way of getting non-Gaussianity, which is absolutely not nothing to do with interaction, is the dynamic current. Sure, sure. We looked into that. You know, it has been seen in uh, your our first silicon. It's a very famous yeah. model for our first silicon. Uh, it can also work, but uh, when we, th you know, we don't have any quantitative weight of ruling out either of these. But even that model can work when you have a phase separated system like but that. Sure, no there is no interaction there. Yeah, it is just you know you have various path and you are dynamically redistributing. Sure, 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 definitely. Yeah. So, in some of your slides, you showed that uh, here. Ah, ah, ah. <laughs> okay. In some of your slides, you showed that the fluctuation in the voltage was in nano scale. So, yeah. I, uh, I'm just curious. Wh I mean, uh, what is the precision with which one can measure the voltage? You know, uh, if you go out, or in the will kill you with a gun. You know, he's sitting with <laughs> that. You know, we can measure fraction of a nano volt. We have techniques here. Actually, I'm very yeah. so I don't know. Do what? I then you can have point zero zero one nanovolt. Point one nanovolt is an experimental problem. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. See, in the ferromagnetic insulating regime in the ionides, yeah. 